you kind of look at at that. Um, sorry, there's the window. Um, so I, I kind of looked into that and started learning stuff, um, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do. So I kind of graduated and then had no job for a year as I figured it out. Um, and then I got hired to do AV testing, uh, which is essentially just like uh, psychology experiments on real people instead of um, students and um, did A-B testing for it. That was at Guitar Center. So I um, worked there for about a year and a half um, running their A-B testing program. And then I realized that I did actually wanna do data science. <laughs> um, and there was a program at the time that I think closed because of COVID, but um, they their whole concept was taking PhD students or graduates and helping them sell their skills um, as data scientists. So um, I knew a bunch of people who had done it and joined the program in uh, January of 2020, um, <laughs> which <laughs> turned out to be really bad timing uh, because in order to do the program, you have to quit your job, their full-time job. Um, and do the program full time. And the program was two months long. So it ended in March of 2020. And that's when we were all applying for jobs and all of hiring froze. And it was really scary. Um, but I ended up getting placed still by the program um, about nine months later, six months later. I don't remember exactly, but um, I got into this position at Nordstrom. I started out again as a data analyst. Um, but then um, got a promotion about six months in. So I've been a data scientist now for about a year and a half. Um, so I'm very excited that there's now data science programs. So you don't have to like kind of wander around in <laughs> data analyst world as much. Um, so yeah, that's my, that's my whole story. Oh. <laughs> I have Thanks, to. Martha. I have to do that once during the, the presentation, don't I? Um, Andy, would you please um, introduce yourself yeah. um, with what you graduated in and a, and a quick walk through your career path? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, Andrew Sutter or Andy uh, is, is fine. Um, I'm a, a vice president of data science and analytics at uh, Citation, which is a small boutique uh, consulting firm that specializes in product data, uh, implementing product uh, systems for the purposes of enhancing e-commerce. So I, I graduated in 95, so a little, little bit longer ago. <laughs> um, now, then, just so you know, this, this is a good, I, I like to hear, especially from all of you with your varying backgrounds, because it is amazing how many people come from data science from, from so many different disciplines, and, and that's not unusual. And, and, I, and I think we should encourage that, actually, because it just makes the whole you know, feel just more diverse, more interesting, and, and actually just gives you more applications to 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 apply that knowledge to, which is great. Um, but so I, I I focus on international business. Um, I thought I was going to be just kind of a you know finance guy. I went into a, a, like a management program uh, for a big logistics company um, after I graduated, which kind of led me in sales, which I got to tell you I was not good at. Uh, <laughs> it's terrible. Um, so, and, and, I, and I got transferred to Chicago uh, during that time, but it was great. Well, I, I loved operations about the company that I was working for. So I wanted to learn more about that. Um, but I ended up going back to school, went to DePaul University for uh, a graduate program in e-commerce technology. Uh, so I focused on programming and it was kind of a risk because I didn't know that that's what I wanted to do. That's I didn't do it at Linfield for sure. I spent some time in the computer labs, but I was probably just, you know, looking at the early stages of the internet then trying to check out a book at the new york public library or something <laughs> but but i i digress uh, but so i took the risk and did that and i in, in the middle of getting my graduate degree i was working full-time at a pretty remedial job which was actually perfect because i got to you know try out my programming skills on my job and started automating my own job started learning about the data behind every little operation that happened and i was just infinitely curious. And if I would emphasize anything to all of you, it's to retain that infinite curiosity, no matter where you land, ask questions, meet people, find out where information goes, because the more you understand about how the people work and the data that goes underneath their work flow, 
the more effective you're going to be. So I spent the last 20 years, like I, I started doing that and I started getting promoted because I got like, oh, this guy, you know, can actually deliver some reporting, can deliver, uh, the, can learn about the data warehouse, can learn about the, the, the ERP systems, all these things that run the company. Um, and I just started e evolving into this business intelligence uh, field, which was the, the hottest thing in the early 2000s. Um, and they just kept evolving, um, you know? And so as I started, you know, moving up in the company, pretty soon I was uh, running global uh, global teams around the world, like, you know, literally, you know, building every kind of application, every kind of, you know, automated system or analytical, visual analytics pl uh, platform you can think of. I finally just decided, you know, the big kind of company thing wasn't for me. And so I decided to move uh, on to a small boutique firm. I was like employee number five. And now I'm a, now we've got 60 employees, so we're growing growing nice. But this is where I started getting into data science because uh, one of the things about um, uh, focusing on product data and e-commerce is people want to make. I mean, you, you see it yourselves just as consumers. You know, you, you go to Amazon, you go to various sites, and they're they're recommending products to you. You see uh, in marketing to you all sort of. You, know, you see it when you watch Netflix, what it's recommending to you. All these things about the data that's that's being put together is finally being leveraged in machine learning platforms and all kinds of interesting interesting ways. And we're creating new products out of it. Um, so I just, I could not be more thrilled with this journey, but it, it definitely took, you know, it, it's, it's interesting how we're all kind of falling into this. Um, and I'm excited to see where it you know, takes us next. Oh, and I think Steve, Steve's probably your next, right? <laughs> yes, Steve is next, and I was trying to unmute mine so I could invite him to do that. So thank you. Good afternoon, and nice to meet everybody. Uh, my name is Steve Hall. I'm a graduate of Winfield's Computing Science program uh, back in 1998. Uh, since then, I've worked in a variety of transactional systems uh, across, uh, I think, at least three different uh, types of organizations, including insurance, logistics, and manufacturing. Uh, I've built out some of the transactional systems that sit behind like Nike's running app for membership. Some of those systems we were testing at a thousand transactions per second to handle, you know, like holiday load. Uh, so, you know, we do some, we do some real throughput here. Um, more recently, uh, I pivoted after uh, kind of building a recommendations engine for uh, membership. And then I pivoted to the kind of the big data world. And in the big data world, uh, I'm working on a really a couple of simple ideas, which are uh, how do we find, how do we help users find, understand, and get access to the data that we have in our data lake house environment so that they can get business value out of it? Uh, that includes things like data catalog across various geos. Uh, we're spread across. We've got a data lake that spans four geographies. Uh, and then we've got um, uh, other things that we're trying to do for uh, data access control to meet all of the various uh, compliance laws around the world. Uh, so that's, that's what I work on today. Uh, for education more recently, I just finished uh, Wharton's Chief Technology Officer Program, which was an amazing experience. Uh, early, uh, early December, I'll go there for the graduation event in Philadelphia, so that'll be fun. Yeah, that is recent. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. All right, so students, now it's your turn to ask questions. So who has a question for our panelists? Kate, do you have any questions that you want to have them make sure they address today? Whoever asked um, the first question with the free programming. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, it's uh, interesting to hear that, you know, we're we're all kind of coming um, at this uh, from, from different avenues. Um, and so I know, yeah, Sierra kind of touched on that this was surprising. So I guess Andy and uh, Stephen, did you also find that how much, like, I guess that you've now become a data scientist surprising or was this always something that 
you kind of thought you might be interested in? Yeah, I'll take, yeah. So honestly, um, I'm a, just a data geek. You know, that, that's just all, that's just what, what I am, I will always be. And, and I don't, that just came about just through, it's it just an organic, I don't know exactly how to explain it, but I was very lucky to find that passion. And I think just because of that passion, like it just, you kind of just go with wherever it takes you, you know, it, it's, you just kind of, you know, it's, you know, it's first it's business intelligence and then it's like, oh, okay, well, that, now you built your dashboard, but how do we build predictive analytics? How do we kind of guess where things are going to be going? And then when you start to get more and more data, uh, and, and and especially the, the cloud uh, platforms really expanded this because, you know, now you can integrate your data with so many supplementary sources and so many different things that it, it actually, even though it seems simpler, it actually makes it a lot more complicated. Um, so you need people who understand information, understand like how to kind of bring this together and to start making predictions. And you can literally start building products out of it, ideas out of it, and deliver solutions to people in ways you never thought of. So you know, when it comes to things like experimentation or, you know, trying to, or even automation is another big thing. I've always been into uh, automating processes and things like that. Uh, and one of the things about automated like machine learning is great because there's a lot of things that people still today, to this day, especially with the outsourcing that's been going on the past you know, decade or so, there's so many operations that have been moved offshore for people to go and like literally do things manually in mass scale, where in, in some cases, not all, but in some cases, you can actually start bringing that back and you can start delivering, you know, instead of just doing repeatable, boring processes for, I don't care who you are, anywhere in the world, eventually you're going to get bored with it. Um, you know, it, like, it, these are some things machines can like learn from your repeated processes and start to make predictions and start to make uh, outputs that you can actually leverage, which actually streamlines operations even more. So I don't know, I, I'm excited by all that. And that's like, yeah, they, they just put a label on it, data science, it's fantastic. <laughs> it sounds cool. <laughs> I'll give a uh, slightly different answer to that, Kate. So uh, I'm really not a data scientist, uh, but that doesn't mean that uh, I don't work in the area. Um, what I'm really doing is bringing capabilities to uh, the data that we have so that the smart data scientists can get value out of the data that we have. Um, with over a quarter of a million tables spread across four geographies, uh, it's super challenging for people to find, understand, and get access to the data that's available. Um, I won't be saying anything that I shouldn't hear, uh, but if you think about Nike for a moment, uh, if folks did manufacturing and only manufacturing at the scale that Nike does manufacturing, you'd have a huge successful business with a lot of information. If you did only design at the scale that Nike does product design and nothing else, you'd be very proud of the company that you built and you'd have a lot of data. If you did nothing but international inbound logistics to manufacturing for materials going into the supply chain, uh, same story, outbound logistics, uh, brick and mortar retail, um, online retail, direct to consumer, right? These are all different businesses that are all stacked into Nike. Every one of them has their own data. And there's really interesting capabilities that you can bring to the world when you look at what could I do to optimize bringing the right products to the right markets and the right sizes at the right times using all this data that we have available to us, right? There's no point in shipping, you know, like size 14 to Japan. Um, there's, there's no point in shipping colors that aren't popular with your demographics. Um, you know, so you can start to bring things like outside data about, you know, hey, what's trending for popular colors in particular geographies, maybe by bringing in fashion magazines. And then you could start to, you know, optimize how you run your operations, just for kind of a trivial example, right? But to do that at scale across, you know, millions of consumers, uh, is uh, really quite a challenge. And, and what I helped what I helped deliver is the ability to find, understand, and get access to that data in order to run all of those things. Um, we work on technologies like uh, Spark. We work on technologies like Presto. 
Um, I've been involved with uh, uh, HTAP MPP graph databases. Uh, let me put that into context. HTAP means hybrid analytical and transactional processing. And MPP means massive parallel processing. So we're talking about a graph database that you could spin up to thousands of individual nodes on a cluster. Uh, I'm aware of one organization that had 40 billion with a B edges connecting 7 billion with a B uh, nodes in the graph. And they were doing analytics for uh, healthcare uh, on that graph database, for example. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a lot of interesting things going on today that uh, didn't even exist when I graduated from that field. So thinking back to, I guess, all of your time uh, at Linfield, was there um, some like courses that really um, either you now find helpful in your current job or um, as a person? Sierra, you want to take a shot at that? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, it was actually really weird looking at the, the curriculum for data science because it was essentially like all the classes that I took um, just like on my own with how I had put all of my majors together. Um, but I think the most surprising one for me was um, that I've used is proofs. <laughs> Um, because there was something that I was being asked to do and I look I, like, it was one of those problems where you're like, this seems like it would be really like obvious and not complicated. And then I realized that it was actually impossible to do in certain situations. And my boss was like, not convinced of this. So I <laughs> ended up writing a full proof and was like, look, I can't do this. It's impossible. Um, and that ended up saving me a lot of time and, and pain, I think. So. Nice. Very nice. I'm going to take a slightly um, different answer to that question. In 2010, I found myself in China uh, for five months um, working for Tektronix embedded in, in uh, Shanghai. And uh, I was over there outsourcing my own job. When they, when they talk about, you know, lean in, uh, yeah, that's leaning in, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> here's what I learned uh, in my fourth month in, in uh, Shanghai. I said to Sam Gao, I said, uh, hey, Sam, I've, I've got a question. Would you mind telling me if I'm right or not? And he said, sure, what's your question? And I said, my question is, or my guess is, when you go to college in China, all the exams are multiple choice. Am I right or not? And he goes, yes, of course. Uh, how else would you do it? And why do you ask? <laughs> my, my huge takeaway from that experience was I was working with people who had, you know, like the equivalent of a master's degree, but they really had no critical thinking and no problem solving capabilities. Uh, why? because the communist government wanted uh, to maintain totalitarian control of the communist party. So they didn't really want to teach people critical thinking that could be applied to how they're running the country. It's the critical thinking that has sustained me uh, over a 25 year period, uh, working on technologies today that didn't even exist when I graduated, cloud computing, didn't even exist when I graduated. Database systems that didn't even exist when I graduated. Uh, things like um, Apache Pino, which I'm working on right now, uh, Apache Spark, um, Presto, other, other big data technologies, lake house architectures, you know, none of it existed at the time. Uh, it's really the critical thinking that is that is, I think, the key skill in my view. I see. I, I couldn't think of any particular class, but I, I definitely the, the the size of the school I think helped me quite a bit because just the feeling that you get you could you feel like you could accomplish a lot at Linfield because you can it, it, it's it's not too big it's not too small you feel like you can you can you can learn something new you can join a club you can get answers to questions you can meet different people in a wide variety of places in a, in a very short amount of time which is 
a great way to learn rapidly and, and a great way to learn how to really approach the world and to approach like what you do with your with your knowledge and, and how you express it because it, it you know it, 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 there's not a one size fits all uh in this world and you just you know I, I, that, that's the most i got out of it just it, it definitely having the you know, broader kind of liberal arts education it just gives me a good feeling of balance and and i i, I still appreciate that today I have a question in regards to the accessibility of this field. As you think about our students who have that critical thinking, ready to enter the workforce in or around places you work, but not at your level, where are some good entry points for the data analytics, data scientists, um, and folks you work with who aren't quite as seasoned, but, but are getting that experience in the field? Yeah, that's, that's that's really good. I, I actually, there's a I, there's not enough um, people to fill the the roles that are out there for a, a data anything almost. Uh, you know, let alone data scientists. Data scientists probably the, one of the hard, hard, hardest fields to actually find uh, people to fill. So I, I do think, especially if you're um, if you have some of that background, you will have no trouble <laughs> really starting at that level. But I mean, data analyst, uh, you've got, you know, even if you're just like a visual analytics person who just wants to tell a story and that, and by the way, that's really important. Like whatever the title is called, because titles just, they, they, there's so many, you just throw a dart at it. Um, you know, data analyst, one, two, three, data engineer. That's another one. It's a better name. <laughs> it should be like that because sometimes data analysts don't have a lot of technical skills. Um, but nevertheless, what, if, if you are bringing a math background, engineering background uh, to these roles, just remember what you're doing ultimately at the end of the day is telling a story. You're telling a story about information and, and how it can, like what it's doing, what it could do, what it's not doing, like all those different like angles of things is what you're, what you're trying to do. So I would, when you're starting out, I mean, this is, you, you want to emphasize that that's the type of role that you're looking for. You want to help people tell stories, help people connect the dots, help people find information or help connect information that's difficult to connect with. Just like Steve was talking about with all those all those different data points or even industries within industries. Um, you know, that's the, if you come with that passion and that enthusiasm, that right there will open up many doors despite the skill sets you may be bringing to the table. Because it's really the, I think it's honestly, I mean, maybe I have a little, you know, been a little too seasoned, but it's it's that type of passion that really can set you apart when you're really first starting out. And, and I think if you start that way, you're just going to grow that way as well. Sierra, you want to take a crack at that? Uh, sure. Yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think a very similar answer. I Like I, in my head, I had a very similar answer to what um, Andy just said, but um, I, I think also what he said earlier is really important, which is like kind of like the passion to like optimize everything. Um, I think one way you can get in is just like kind of get into any like data adjacent role, like doesn't really matter what the real title is. And then you just start making everyone's lives as easy as possible <laughs> um, and just finding like little ways that you can like optimize things and improve them. And then, you know, pretty quickly you can move up because people like when you help them. <laughs> so um, you can get into more of the role that you want. And like that way you're not like trying to find the perfect one right off the bat. You can kind of get in where you, you can and then move where you want to go. That's a good point. And there's more bad data out there than good data. So there's plenty of opportunity. <laughs> Even if you start out just cleaning things up, which sounds boring, but believe me, it's Actually not. Uh, it's actually quite interesting and you can deliver a lot of smiles, just like Sierra said. So um, yeah, that's a, a good segue, I think. Uh, there's there's definitely roles in what they call data engineering. And data engineers take data that's maybe in transactional systems around the business and they build data transformation pipelines to bring the data in and land it into the systems that drive our big data and analytics platforms. Um, we have probably uh, no fewer than uh, four different transformations 
that happen across that ecosystem. It comes in as raw, then it goes to cleansed, then it goes to curated, integrated, aggregated typically. And your reporting layers are, are being written off of your aggregated data, uh, sometimes a little bit further back. But uh, that's, that's certainly a place to get started. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, another story here, because I love the power of stories, and I think stories are spot on. Uh, I think that was an excellent call out, by the way. Um, Phil Knight built Nike using stories. Uh, and he'll 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 just tell you that straight out, right? The power of a good story, uh, it inspires and it motivates people, uh, and it helps people understand and it helps the information stick. Um, the story, uh, my neighbor, uh, her daughter was going off to University of Florida to pursue her master's in epidemiology, and I said, "What do you know about big data?" She's like, well, "What's big data?" All right, uh, and, and so why do I tell that story? Um, I think it's domain knowledge today that is going to really start to separate out the folks who are working in uh, various things. It's almost like, you know, I'm working in epidemiology to solve that problem. I need to do big data stuff. Uh, and so I'm gonna go learn big data, right? But so if you could bring some kind of domain experience together, um, in whatever a domain might be that is of interest to you with some capabilities in big data, uh, I think that would be an excellent starting point. Any students come up with any questions they want to ask? All right, well, I have a question. I would like to hear from each of you the role that networking played in your career and your career advancement. Huge, huge, yeah. It, it's, it is one of those things that it's it's great because it, it is like a like a trending graph, right? It is just, you start off with your, net, this is your network, right? That your network, your colleagues in, in school, your, your professors, that you have maybe a few of your employers, um, but it, 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 it is easier these days because you can, you know, build up your LinkedIn network. It makes it easier to keep connected. Um, but the, the important thing is to always nurture the network. Don't just let it grow or, organically behind you. I, I, I've been guilty of that. Don't get me wrong, but, but you should really try to nurture that and constantly be looking through your network and try, because it, it's a two-way street. Always remember that. Um, it's not just for you trying to in, improve yourself. You also will be, maybe not in the beginning, but eventually you'll never know you could be helping someone else out too in their career um, helping them make connections because it's it's about connecting the right personalities with the right skill sets and the right culture it's a hard thing to do it, it, people always land in the wrong spot in either one of those tiers and uh, you know it, it's just you gotta like leverage your network and always uh, try to emphasize like what what are you not doing have you made a recommendation to someone have you recognized their skills have you recognized their accomplishments uh, whether it be you know professional or, or personal, you know either either one. Uh, continue to grow this because you just never know, what, like if you could be the person that can help or if you're going to benefit from that relationship. So yeah. Um, I have a a really good example of like how important it is. <laughs> so when I was applying for jobs during the pandemic, I saw this the role that I ended up getting online. Um, and just kind of like threw an application at it and got rejected. And then a few weeks later, I found out that the, the program that I had was going through had like connections and they personally introduced me and I got the role that I had previously been rejected for when I had no connections. So, um, yeah, it, I feel like that's what I was like, I, I had already knew that like it was really important, but that like really drilled at hope for me because like I was obviously five, perfect for the job. I got it. It just, I they didn't even look at my resume because I had no like way to get in. That's that's a great story. It uh, really exemplifies the point. Um, I was recently in uh, Wharton's Chief Technology Officer program, and uh, in that program, they were talking about executive presence. That was one of the electives. And um, in that elective, they spoke about the importance of 
having a solid network, networking, and not only not only the importance of having one, but really how to go about building one and how to go about building one with intent. Um, it was a, kind of a big slap in the head for me, which I kind of needed. <laughs> it's not something I've done particularly well, looking back. And um, partly because I really uh, knew it was important, but I didn't really know how to go about doing it. Uh, so how to proceed with intent, how to build the right network, not a redundant network. Not a lot of people are going to tell you which one here necessarily, uh, but a powerful network um, of, of um, people who can give you uh, good advice, honest input, um, you know, other, other kinds of things like that are critically important. Um, I would add on one of the things they spoke about in that program was uh, just world theory versus rough world theory. Uh, in a just world theory, uh, it basically looks like, hey, I, I work hard and I do a good job and that will get recognized and I'll be promoted. Um, yeah, not so much. <laughs> that, that really doesn't happen. I mean, it kind of happens, but uh, it doesn't really happen. In a, a rough world theory, it's the combination of uh, hard work, uh, quality work, and your network, who you know, um, that, that really helps you progress and be resilient throughout your career. So uh, I haven't done the job that I should have done at that. Um, I need to do better. And, and it's, it's actually something that's on my, on my list now every week as a reflection item to say, how do I do on my network? Thank you. Um, Pate, do you have more questions or students? Do you have a specific question for one of our panelists? I can always, I'm going to ask questions all day long. So in regards to the current workplace culture that you're experiencing, what are positives uh, for you personally, and what do you value in that workplace culture that uh, allows you to, to be effective in your position? And then if you want to also address the, the contrary to that of challenges of workplace culture in today's workplace reality, which is um, just different than it ever has been before. Well, it's like it's on Zoom, right? It's just like, just like this. I, and I, honestly, and that's where I work the, the most, was just telling people when I first jumped on. Uh, that very fact. I mean, this is this is the thing is it, 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 you you can balance a culture in a, in a physical space, and that's great. But certainly, the pandemic has shook that whole notion right upside down. And one of the things that just to keep in mind is that culture can still thrive. It may be different, but it still can. The first thing you do is you keep your cameras on. <laughs> you keep your, you light them up. You speak clearly. You you know you, you dress appropriately, at least from the top up. Um, and you know you have an. <laughs> A nice background and all that kind of stuff, but it's it's but it's also making sure that it, 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 when you're building a culture, you're you're obviously hiring people that have similar val similar values about customer focus or you know broadening the world, understand whatever whatever the the, the focus is, uh, but to make sure that you constantly are making time for people to engage not just in business alone, but also in fun as well, and that can be a little more challenging when you're online, but you know have online games have you know. Do do fun things together, play, you know, like get to know. It sounds cheesy, but do those get to know you games and things like that as as, pe as people do. Um, it's important. It's it's important to learn of people's skills because it, it, in today's in today's like, like at least in my uh, consulting culture, you know, we have a lot of different people with different backgrounds. You never know like who might actually be. It's like almost like you're recruiting internally uh, m more so these days. And, and it, the, the the notion of companies having silos and you don't necessarily know what people are doing is kind of melting away as you start to, you know, kind of navigate your company like your own social network and, and recruiting teams and, you know, building up, you know, delivering projects and solutions, all, all those sort of things. Um, and making sure you're always recognize people's accomplishments and rewarding that and all those good things. Yeah. Yeah, what do you think? 
Uh, yeah, I, I've had very opposite experiences. Like one company I worked for was um, definitely like bordering on like toxic workplace. And the one I'm currently working for is um, much more concerned with like uh, work-life balance. Like I think, I think just seeing like how people treat like after like overtime and things like that is like a very good evidence for like how the whole job is going to go. Um, I think in general, your, um, relationship with your manager is probably one of the more important ones. Um, like if they treat you like a human, like you're probably <laughs> more set, um, it's going to be a better experience than if, if, um, if they, if they basically, if, if you feel respected for what you're bringing to the table and everything, and you're getting, um, like, like, um, Andrew said, uh, like, can't think of the word now, um, just like credit for what you've done. Like that's in my experience is like generally like the big signs for a good, healthy working environment. That's a uh, great insight, Sierra. Um, I would add on uh, fit matters. Uh, I think that there is a, a lot of wisdom to be had by saying, how do I go about my first position with intent? Uh, not just can I find something that's available, but but how do, it, it's really such a critical um, opportunity, that very first role that you take. Uh, it's it, obviously, hey, you can move on, you can do other things over time, but it's not it's not life or death. It's not going to ruin your entire career. But if you can find that right first role that is the right fit because you've proceeded with the right intent because you know what you want to accomplish, uh, that would be my advice. Um, and I would double down on the idea that um, working for somebody who believes in you, that, that right manager, somebody who believes in you, somebody who can be a good coach to you and to be open to coaching um, and to find somebody who really believes in you and, and wants to help you further your career. Um, I, I think that those are the uh, critical elements um, you know, Nike, Nike does that really well, uh, probably better than most companies I've worked at. Uh, I'm privileged to actually be part of an organization that values all of those things. We're not perfect, right? We, we have our moments, but, uh, but um, really, uh, if you could find those kinds of key uh, opportunities, those are the ones to go after. Um, the other thing I would add on, um, answering your other question, Michael, is uh, what's challenging? Uh, I think distributed teams are challenging. Uh, you know, we're working with teams in Poland. We're working with teams in India. We're working with teams in China. We're all on different time zones. It's only a little bit of the business day that you can actually interface with each other. There's cultural differences, you know, when people in India go like this, doesn't mean they agree with you. <laughs> Just means they understand they heard what you said, right? Uh, and so uh, those things are uh, really, really challenging aspects. Um, there's an interesting Harvard Business Review article from 2015 uh, titled Remote Teams That Work. And they talk about a framework that they call the split framework. Structure, process, language, identity, and technology, I think, are the elements of the split framework. And um, we've attempted to be successful uh, doing remote teams and ignoring about three of the five elements that HBR says you need to be successful. So we're on our learning journey with it. <laughs> And, and trying to readjust. I was on a, I was on a team where we basically had um, two people in the U.S. and about uh, eleven in Poland, and it, it just was not working. And the reason it wasn't working is a structural problem, right? Uh, it's it's the 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 mass of all the decisions was happening over in Poland. 
And it was like, uh, and, and, and who are you people over there? You know, who cares? Uh, <laughs> and so, and so um, you know, uh, more of a balanced kind of thing of, of you know, near, near to nearly 50-50 would have been a more appropriate approach, uh, but that's not what we did, for example. So um, this is a challenging world that we live in. Uh, I do think that face-to-face uh, -face opportunities are still critical. Great. Okay. Now you all talked about how important these teams are. How does one assess that during the application process? What are what are some clues that students should be looking for um, during an interview, during a networking situation? What do you recommend for that? Well, you could always ask what type of you know events the company holds. You know, what do you hold any annual you know Christmas parties? Is there um, seminars you get to go to as a part of like your ongoing training, um, other networking opportunities and things like that in your particular field. That's something I think is a fair question to ask it just because, you know, it, it, like you want to understand at what degree is that, is that organization, you know, keyed into the industry that they're in? Are they, you know, are they rewarding, you know, good employees with participation in those events? Um, and, and, and things of that nature, are they actually, are they, how much are they reinvesting their profits into your know, research and development or, you know, other, other things like that? Like, I think that this gives you a sense of like, do they um, want to continue to grow? Are, are they, or are they just thinking quarter to quarter? You know, is, is that really the emphasis? Because believe me, there's still plenty of companies that do just that. Um, and I think what I, I just hope, and that's okay for, for a little bit, but I think, Ideally, we'd want to find a company that is is, is reinvesting in their people um, and their culture when they can. I would say that there's um, some opportunities here to ask some good questions. Um, and questions of stories and examples are good questions to ask. Um, you know, tell me uh, about somebody in your company who has progressed uh, quickly and, you know, what did they do to progress quickly? Um, if they can, if they can tell that story, um, that would be a good indicator. Um, you know, tell me, tell me uh, about you know your approach to coaching and mentoring. If they could tell that story, uh, it's probably the right you know organization to work for. Um, it's it's almost like the reverse of what you used to hate to be asked. Tell me where you want to be in five years. Uh, to tell me where I could be in five years and how I might get there. Yeah, I feel like it's a really hard thing to judge from an interview in general. One question I've seen that's kind of helpful is um, asking like, what is one of their biggest like pain points um, that they face on a daily basis? Because it also helps you like look like you care um, about what is a problem for them, but you kind of, sometimes people can be a little bit too honest because they constantly have to deal with it. Like, you know, oh, our database is super, super slow for no reason kind of a thing, or you can maybe get some more, you know, insight into like interpersonal problems. Um, I, I think a lot of it is also just kind of like seeing, kind of getting a gut feeling from like meeting the team and like, what they talk about and like, do you just get along as people? Um, but yeah, it's, it's sometimes it's a little bit of a, of a die roll, but yeah. Um, you might also ask uh, companies today about their uh, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion um, initiatives and, and, you know, um, what's going on with that. Um, I'd add on, uh, I, I actually had one interview, uh, it's a lot of years ago now, but the uh, hiring manager actually told me at the end of the interview, he's like, well, you had me on my toes, he says to me. He's like, you were like interviewing us. Well, of you course I'm interviewing you, right? I'm probably gonna spend more time with you than I'm gonna spend uh, you know, with my family <laughs> every day, right? Of course I'm interviewing you, right? Um, and, and I think it's a healthy way to go. on that. Two-way street. All right. So 
Um, I would like each of you alumni guests to tell us one final piece of advice. The, what's the one thing that you want these students to remember about meeting you and hearing your career story? So I would say, and I, I might have, this might sound like a little repeat because I, I said at the beginning, is just never stop asking questions. That that infinite curiosity is going to take you in the directions of your career you can't even imagine. Um, and it's going to provide you with the knowledge of the organization, the people you work with, the data you're going to work with, the platforms you have to learn, the programming language you're going to have to learn, like all that stuff. You did, but you always ask questions. That, that I, I cannot emphasize that, that enough because you know, it doesn't matter the size of the organization. Things span into infinite spaces and in infinite directions. You're never going to have answers to all your questions, and you're going to have to be okay with that, but just still never stop. Thank you. Sierra, what's your advice? I think I think for me, it's like, it's okay if you don't know exactly what you want to do right now. Um, you have a lot of time to figure it out. And like when I was at Linfield, like I said, there was nobody else. Like I, I actually like got a lot of judgment <laughs> from people sometimes because they couldn't figure out why psychology and math would ever go together. Um, but I kind of just ignored it and I was like, I want to do it. I don't really care. Um, like data science was barely like existing when I when I graduated. So, you know, I, I just sort of accidentally happened into this really, you know, good field that I like I had no idea was there. So, you know, doing something that you just really enjoy doing um, could, you know, put you somewhere really, really fun and cool that you wouldn't expect. Great, Steve, what's your advice? So uh, this week I was banging my head against uh, getting data to uh, be loaded into uh, Apache Pino and uh, trying to figure out the indexing on it. Uh, yesterday I went to a seminar where they said, oh, yeah, on average it takes three to five days to get that figured out for most people. Uh, we're working on a system to make that smarter and better, right? And I was like, oh, okay, I feel better now, right? Um, Learn to uh, have some patience and grace with ourselves, I think is really good advice. Um, tenacity, um, you know, don't, don't give up, just, just keep, keep working on it. And um, know that, you know, there are people out there who actually are supporting us and rooting for us and wanna see us be successful. And by the way, uh, when, we, when we go on an interview, you know, the, the people who are inviting you in for an interview, they actually do want to see you be successful, right? They, they do want to fill the role, right? So uh, tenacity and patience, uh, you know, keep, keep, keep keeping at it. All right, students, I want to hear from you. What's one thing that really resonated with you from our panel discussion today or what's one takeaway or action item that that you're going to uh, do as the result of meeting Sierra, Andy, and Steve? I'll go first. Yay. What so thing I got is you can we get was you can go and you can get a jo job doing something with data science and at first it might not be necessarily exactly what you're wanting to do we say you can eventually move up and get to the position that potentially you're wanting and do what you're wanting to do fantastic thank you aiden a takeaway i definitely got was that the interview is like for interviews it's definitely a two-way street and it's just like always just thought it was like maybe like one way they just keep answering like questions for us but definitely good to know that to answer like questions back and, and i'll just say one, one thing on that um and believe it or not there's a lot of candidates who don't ask questions and so even right there you will set yourself apart absolutely i've been on a lot of interviews with folks on both sides of this and uh the folks who don't ask questions don't seem interested yep, that's right Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've definitely hired people based on them asking good questions. <laughs> here, here. 
What's another takeaway? I'll probably take away the importance of networking apart from just being good at what you're doing. I'll take away the infinite curiosity, always learning, like not expect even at the entry level, not expecting to know everything and just always asking questions and being willing to learn. Um, I'll probably take away just being open-minded and, um, oh my gosh, how do I phrase that? Like, geez, wow, phrasing words, sorry. Um, like being open to new changes and like whatever comes your way within your career. There we go. All right. Well, I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up now. Um, I want to thank Sierra, Andy, and Steve for uh, spending this time with us today, sharing about their career, their own personal story. Um, I know, I know, I learn something every time I get to have those career conversations with our alumni. So, so I, I thank you very much for um, for joining us today. Um, Kate, I'd like to thank you for, for reaching out and asking us to collaborate again. Um, I, I enjoy introducing students to, to alumni. Um, I'd also like to thank Karma. She uh, took a big role in uh, planning this panel and uh, doing uh, the bulk of the correspondence with our alumni. Uh, so thank you very much, Karma. Um, and as I said earlier, um, I will share, um, I got permission from our alumni panelists, so I'm going to share their emails with Kate and um, she'll be able to uh, pass those along to you uh, students if you uh, want to reach out for a specific conversation or to touch base or to connect on LinkedIn, add them to your network. Um, and I'd also like to remind you um, that, that we in career development um, are happy to connect you with other alumni. So if you want to meet other students in uh, data science or a specific company, um, stop by the office or um, reach out to us. Um, our email is career at linfield.edu. Um, we would be happy to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation or uh, connect you with alums for the same. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today and um, hope you enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you all, this has been a thrill. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And if anybody has any questions, reach out by all means. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. All right, see you later. And then there were the three most important people on the call. Yeah, oh, of course. <laughs> So Karma, you planned mm -hmm. this. How cool is that? Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you were able to join us today. Um, yeah. You can see the, the fruits of your labor and, and see the impact. And I appreciate you piping in at the end with your own takeaway. So yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, All right. Well, um, did you remember to clock in and clock out? Of course I didn't. Um, I will put those punches in. Okay. <laughs> Great. Be sure. All right. Thank you. Be fine. All right. Bye. Have a good rest of your guys' day. You too. Bye bye.